Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We thank you for bringing us to yet another Sunday, to a day that we celebrate mothers. And we just pray that you would have your way in the service. Be with us. We know it says in your word that where two or three are gathered in your name, there will you be also. So we come before you, not just those gathered in this physical place, but those who are all over, um, whether we're in our homes, whether we're in our cars, whether we're outside enjoying the beautiful weather, and whenever we are participating, because thankfully this is being recorded, we pray you will meet us where we are. We thank you for the technology that makes it possible for us to come together and for keeping us safe. We pray right now that you would be the focus of all that we do today, that you would have your way, meet us here. We can't do this without you. We just need to feel your presence and know that you are with us during this time. So we thank you in advance for meeting us for this time of praise and for this time of worship. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service. Today is Mother's Day. Um, so, you know, without further ado, I want to make sure that we celebrate our mothers, all the mothers who are part of this congregation, all the mothers who are part of our community. And I'm going to say a little bit more about them later, but so you know, happy Mother's Day from me and from the Pivot Point Gathering family. Um, as you can imagine, Mother's Day is, you know, especially important because mothers are the backbone of our community you know without our mothers where would we be like you know in addition to going through the trouble of rearing us you know raising us teaching us like and i feel like a lot of churches don't spend enough time talking about how important motherhood is and i want to make it clear that when i talk about motherhood i'm not even just talking about biological mothers or adoptive mothers but also those who do the role of mothering, you know, so that means you might not have any biological children, but you've still been a mother figure, you know, so godmothers, aunties, big cousins, like, you know, whoever you are, we salute you and want you to know that the lives of the children you have reached, you know, many of whom who have probably grown at this point, you have had a big impact no matter what your role. But we're going to talk a little bit more about Mother's Day a little later, but I am glad to see all of you. Um, hey, Deaconess Julia. Hi, Sister Sylvia. Um, yeah, this is, it's been a busy weekend. It's been a busy month already, but we're thankful to be here. I'm glad to see you all. And yes, as you may have figured out, the comments are working again this week. So I can see you all. And it's good because, yeah, sometimes it's like we're in a box and we can't really talk because, you know, one thing, I say this to some extent almost every Sunday, but when you're a minister who is tr trained in the African-American tradition, you know that there's a lot of call and response in what we do. Like we do things, but it's participatory. So we may say things, but we are also looking for like, whether it's nods, whether it's people calling out, we're looking for signs often that make it clear that our congregation or those who are watching understand what we're doing and feel what we're doing, you know, and relate to it. And one thing that has been challenging for me, as I'm sure a lot of my minister counterparts can say, is when you preach to a screen, or in my case, preach to an iPad, um, you don't really know what people are saying or how people feel about what you're saying in general. So the comments, as I've learned, have helped me to proxy that a bit. So I appreciate it when you all write things through. And for the time being, I can actually see them. Obviously, as we grow, I won't be able to see your comments anymore, but I appreciate them now because they let me know, okay, you all are there and I'm not just yelling out to avoid. But anyway, we thank you all for joining us today. And I say we because I'm saying we on behalf of our whole congregation, which includes First Lady, who was just talking about how much she misses you all today, and also um, Baby Boy. Because as you know, First Lady, during a lot of times with our services, she's up and behind the scenes, but she can't come on camera because one of us is always taking care of Mr. Baby, who is growing and as such needs a lot more attention. 
some of you might remember those days when your children first started walking, which means that they're into everything, which means they pick up everything and put everything in their mouth just if you're not watching them. So we take turns watching, but obviously I have to be out front during service. So once service is over, I get to take him back for a little bit and she gets a bit of time to herself. But happy Mother's Day to all of you. So, and right now, um, I know we normally talk about this a bit, but I just want to give a reminder of how you can find us. Those of you who are watching live now know you can find us on Pivot Point, as Pivot Point Gathering on Facebook, as Pivot Point Gathering on YouTube, underscore pivot, underscore point on Instagram, underscore pivot, underscore point on Twitter, which I have to do a better job of posting our things there, and also underscore pivot, underscore point on TikTok. Um, we've been getting a good amount of feedback on Instagram and TikTok lately, so thank you all. And um, yeah, you can find us at our website, which is at pivotpoint.church. That is pivotpoint.church. If you do .com or .org, it's already taken by somebody else that's not us. But we are findable at pivotpoint.church. So... Um, and I also want to encourage you right now, if you feel led to do so, well, first, follow us, like us, subscribe us on any of those social media platforms because the way the algorithm works, um, your information gets spread out based on the number of followers you have. So that's a part of it. And also, if you like our content, also do what you can to like it, react to it, maybe even write a comment. The more you do that, the more others will get a chance to see you know, what this ministry is about. And I also encourage you to share, which is what I am going to do right now. So I'm about to share us on my personal social media. Presumably, if you all are seeing this right now live, you um, won't see that I've shared it. But I share it and I encourage you to share it as well. Um, well once I find it. Because... That is how people find us. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. But if you like what this needle in a haystack has done in your life and you want your friends and family to know, we encourage you to share. And I'm sharing right now. But again, if you're not the kind of person that likes to share on your social media, I get it. No pressure. I'm glad that you're here. And I do hope that you get something out of today's service. And hi, Miss Vanessa. I see you. You know, it's great how many people just kind of pop in. Um, but, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to jump to our song. Let me make sure there are no other announcements, right? We'll come back to our prayer request later. But we're going to jump to our song. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to a song that has been on my heart lately. You know, lately the songs have been a little brief because, yeah, running a church can be tiring. But I still want to make sure that we have a chance to sing together. So this is a song called I Feel Like Going On, which I'm sure is something that a lot of us can relate to, especially when you're tired. You know, one thing I've learned in this parenting journey for the past year and some change is that even when you're tired, you know, those little eyes are still looking for you and still need you to, you know, be there and support them and meet their needs. And I know mothers feel that in a different way than fathers do. So Maybe this is a song that's been on some of your spirits as well, some of your hearts as well, letting you know that no matter what's going on, you have to keep pressing on. God is with you. So that's what we're going to sing today.
All right, so now we are back. And good morning to all those who put comments in so far. Hey, First Lady, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, what you all can't see is that she and Baby Boy are going on their usual morning walk because like his father, Mr. Baby loves to be outside when the weather is nice. You know, he just loves his morning walk after his breakfast. So she is watching by phone like a lot of you. And he is enjoying the weather. That's why when I open up in prayer, I often talk about people enjoying service and the weather at the same time. Because I know there are some of you who really are out and about. And I'm thankful that the technology makes it possible for you to join us. So good to see you all. So we are going to go into, um, well, we're going to talk about our um, things that we are praying for as a ministry. So I'm going to put that screen up right now so you can see, but don't worry. I'm still going to be on the screen as well, just smaller. So as we do every week, we are praying about our location. You know, yes, we have been doing pretty well as a mostly online ministry, but there are just some things that you need a building to do. You know, we like the idea of having in-person events. And while we can do that pretty well during the weather, you know, when weather's like it is right now, we acknowledge that we um, want to still be able to have some in-person events from time to time when the weather is not as nice. And yeah, that's difficult to do when you don't have a building. So not saying it's impossible, just it'll be easier for us to do that when we get a building. And also, we know there are some people on the other side of the digital divide that can't reach us. You know, right now we're primarily on social media, mostly on Facebook with a bit of YouTube. But we know that for various reasons, there are people who can't reach us. Maybe some people don't have access to the quality technology. You know, you need Wi-Fi or at least high speed Internet to see us. And a lot of people don't have that for various reasons. We also know that with Facebook being our preferred medium, that a lot of people do not use Facebook anymore. You know, that's just, it is what it is. And so we don't want to end up missing out on a large swath of the population because we're dependent upon media platforms that they don't even really use much. I mean, we've been seeing what's been happening with Twitter lately. So we want to be in a position where people can get to us no matter what. And yes, there's some technological things we can do to improve that. But a big thing we can do is have a physical building where we can reach those who aren't keen on social media, those who don't like Facebook or YouTube, those who don't have Wi-Fi. So that's one reason we want to look for a building. And also we want to know where that building should be, you know, because whatever community we're in, that's where we're going to be based. That's where we're going to be doing a lot of our work. When we talk about our capacity, that means our ability to do what it is God has called for us to do. You know, God has given us a pretty big vision. A lot of you know our tagline is, um, breaking barriers and building bridges. That's going to take a lot of people to do that. That's going to take a lot of resources to do that. So right now we are praying that God will send what we need, what we need in terms of people, what we need in terms of money, what we need in terms of ideas, what we need in terms of focus. So that's what we're talking about when we mean capacity. We also want to continue praying about the violence in the streets. It seems like every week there's another mass shooting we're hearing about. It's happening all the time. And our legislators aren't really doing much about it because many of them are getting money from the NRA anyway. So we want to be praying about the, the violence in our streets and also seeing what we can do as pivot point gathering in our particular context, which is the greater Philadelphia area. So be in prayer about that. And we don't just want to be the organization that, you know, is granted pr there's power in prayer, but we also want to be active. So. We are going to be praying for about what we can do, how we can make a difference. I believe there's a lot of power in this community, and we really can use it to make a difference in the lives of those around us. We also want to pray about health in our community. As we know, people of color are subject to biases in the healthcare system that lead to um, poor healthcare outcomes. So we want to play a part in um, addressing that. We also want to continue to pray for those in our community who are dealing with serious illnesses. And there are many, but we thank you all for still being supportive of this ministry. We want to continue praying for our families who are grieving. And again, there are a good number of those. And we want to continue to pray about our political system. As we know, we are great. I guess we are rapidly approaching the fiscal cliff, if you will. You know, 
um, our federal government is about to default on its bills for the first time if our Congress can't come up with some kind of resolution and we know that one party is holding the system hostage to try to get demands from the other, even though historically raising a debt limit has been something that's been <clears throat> bipartisan. It's often been a clean bill separate from any other initiatives. But we have one party right now that just does not want to cooperate. And it can have devastating impacts on the rest of us. And that's just one of the many examples of the issues in our political system. So let's continue to pray that God will send people to our political system who actually care about serving him first and foremost, serving the people that he has called them to, and not just being focused on maintaining power and wealth like so many are. And we are going to get to the announcement that First Lady just put in. But that's the thing, that's what we're praying about right now. See, First Lady, you have great timing. I'm gonna put your comment up so people can see it. Yes, we have, we're having a Mother's Day supply drive collecting diapers, wipes, and formula for the Maternity Care Coalition. And I have put that up right now. Some of you can see it if you have a larger screen, but in general, it gives that information that yes, like First Lady said, we are collecting diapers, wipes, and formula, and we're doing that in person. So if you have any donations you'd like to make, and you have them, today is the last day to make the donations. Please reach out to us, and we will get those donations from you to donate to the Maternity Care Coalition. You can also donate directly to their website, um, well, through their website. Um, but you can see on the screen I have up is they have their QR code that brings you directly to their wish list, and you can pay there. We've had some members do that already. But we want to continue supporting mothers um, because, yeah, motherhood is something that is amazing. It's something that's important. But in a lot of ways in our society, it's a thankless job. It requires a lot of resources that, you know, you may or may not have access to. So we want to do our part as, as a congregation to support mothers who are in need. So thank you for bringing that up again, First Lady. And, yes, we are still supporting the Maternity Care Coalition. Contact us today if you have a donation, all right? And I think that, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mother's Day, and then I'll pull the announcements back up, all right? So, um, yeah, I said a lot about Mother's Day early on, but I just want to make sure that we salute all the mothers in our congregation, you know, and not just, like I said, the mothers who are biological mothers or even adoptive mothers, but also those who have participated in the role of mothering in some way. So whether you're a godmother, an auntie, a big cousin, you know, just a role model for the next generation coming up behind you. If you have done that, if you're a woman who's done those things, you have participated in mothering in some way. So this holiday is for you as well. And and I say that because our society tends to leave out the impact of aunties on mothering. You know, the aunties who will come by and pick up the kids when mother needs a break. The aunties who will drop off a meal. The aunties who will be on the phone as support, you know. And I know in my upbringing, and I'm sure Deaconess Julia can echo this, but there are a lot of things in my life that wouldn't have been as smooth if my mother did not have the help of her sisters, my aunties. And I know I think about them all the time. Most of the time when my mom and I get together, we are often talking about Aunt Rolene and Aunt Onor and how they would feel, and even Aunt Sandra, and how they would feel seeing you know the life that we have right now, the things that we've all been able to accomplish. You know, They were some praying women, and it's just amazing to see their prayers coming into fruition, not just for me, but for my cousins as well. But yeah, so that's why I'm talking about the importance of aunties because, yeah, it really does take a village to raise a child as I am seeing firsthand right now. You know, it, First Lady and I are blessed to have each other, but we're also blessed to have a community around us um, to support. And so I'm pointing out that mothers do need support. Mothering is not a solitary job. Mothering is not something that can be done by one person alone. So whether you are a biological mother, an adopted mother, an auntie, we salute you. 
And I want to give a special shout out to the mothers that are very important to me. So first and foremost, you know, we'll talk about First Lady Tia, you know, who has embarked on this journey of parenthood with me and is currently walking around our community with Mr. Baby, who enjoys the sun, or at least preparing to. I'm not sure if they're out yet, but I just want to salute her because even if you all can't see what she's doing in this ministry as much as maybe you once could for those who've been here with us since we were your will, she still has a major role except for she is doing something else that God has called her to, well, called us to, which is taking care of our son during services. But rest assured, she does want to come back more often. So you'll be seeing her from time to time. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Deaconess Julia, who is always watching, always in the comments. And that is my mother. Um, She has been an amazing influence and confidant, listening ear, source of encouragement. Like First Lady, she is a big part of the reason that I'm still here, still doing this ministry. They both, meaning both First Lady and Deaconess Julia in their own way, would talk to me on the side like, you know, You do have what it takes to be a pastor. God has called you to this. And so there'd be times when I'd be doubting and wondering if I made the right decision. And they'll say, no, like we we believe that God is working through you. And I also have to give a shout out to um, Deaconess Rhonda, Mom Rhonda, who is First Lady's mother. Um, She helps us a lot with baby boy during the week. And she's also a very supportive um, force um, in our lives. And you don't see her in the comments today because she is busy enjoying a girl's trip in Jamaica. So we pray that she'll bring some sunshine back for us <laughs> and that she has great, like a great time there resting, relaxing. And we'll also be praying for her traveling mercies as she flies back in a few days. And to the rest of the mothers of Pivot Point Gathering, we love you all. All right. So I didn't forget anybody. I'm sure if I see you all in person, I have something to say to you too. But we got to keep move on. So one last event that we have coming up, as some of you know, is we are continuing our discussion on the 1619 Project. It's going to be June 10th at 11 a.m. We'll be discussing the next two episodes, Music and Capitalism. Um, it's going to be on Zoom. We will start having information out there for you to register soon. Um, and if you missed the first two episodes, which were on democracy and race, don't worry about it. You can watch them, jump in and catch up with us. And we'll still talk about those as well. But we just feel it's important for us to talk a bit about our history as black people in this country, especially in light of how much controversy there is about teaching it in certain parts of this country. So we look forward to seeing you there. And now, um, I just want to remind you all, if this is your first time watching, f- fill out a contact card so we can be in touch with you. We'd love to hear from you and figure out how we can support you best. Um, if you feel interested in donating to us, here's how you can donate. Um, the link is also above in the description of today's message. And your money will go toward us upgrading our technology, as you can see. We don't have a lot of overhead as a ministry because nobody's getting paid at this point. Well, nobody's getting paid on a regular basis. We do pay guest ministers when they come through. But we are going to have to upgrade our technology. You know, some of you know recently we did upgrade our keyboard. Um, This computer right here is actually my personal computer, but we're about to buy a better one for the church to run a lot of things. Um, We also have two iPads that you can't see in addition to this one. Those iPads are the ones that are operating as cameras. We'll be upgrading those pretty soon. So, and we'll also do some things with this set so that you won't just see the same things around me. So if you're interested, that is where your money is going, aside from our long-term plans of getting a building, you know. So if you would like to support us, your donations will keep us afloat, and we're thankful for those of you who have been donating on a regular basis. And lastly, if you'd like some more information, check us out on at pivotpoint.church. All right? So with that, we are going to go into our um, message for today. All right? 
So if you can open your Bibles, and I'm going to pull up the screen again. If you can open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. That is 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. My usual custom is to wait until somebody types through amen in the comments. I know there aren't as many of you today, so um, I'll give it a few minutes. Well, not a few minutes, because that would take a long time. But I'll give you some time to catch up, and then I'm going to start reading. But if somebody feels like typing through amen, please do that, so I know you're with us. 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. And as some of you may notice um, from the picture here, this is the story of Solomon and the two women who claim to be the mother of the one child. Because as you can see, there are two women, one holding a baby, and they're approaching Solomon. That is what we're talking about today. And yes, the art is going to support that. And in fact, you know what? I'm going to take myself off the screen so that you all can see this better. All right? 1 Kings 3, beginning at verse 16, all right? And it reads thus. Then two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. And thank you. I see the amen came through, just so that you all know an amen did come through. But, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. It happened on the third day after I gave birth that this woman also gave birth to a child and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, only the two of us in the house. This woman's son died in the night because she lay on it. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your maid servant slept and laid him in her bosom, and laid her dead son in my bosom. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him carefully in the morning, behold, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, No, for the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. But the first woman said, No, for the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, The one says, This is my son who is living, and your son is the dead one. And the other says, No, for my son is the dead one. Your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. The king said, Get me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living child in two. Give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose child was the living one spoke to the king, for she was deeply stirred over her son and said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child and by no means kill him. But the other said, He shall neither be mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king said, Give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king. For they saw that the king, um, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. So today, if we're taking notes, the title of today's message is this. Mothers need support. That is, mothers need support. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time you allow for us to spend together thus far. We pray that you would just continue to be in the midst of this service as we move to this preaching moment. We ask that you would have your way, that you would get the glory out of all that we do today. Um, show yourself in this service. Move me out of the way and use me as a vessel that we may hear what it is you have for us today and help us to be better representatives of you wherever you have placed us. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. So, mothers need support. Since it's Mother's Day, we are going to discuss a very well-known passage of scripture 
In fact, I can give First Lady credit because I was going around the house saying, I wonder what I should preach on. And she said, have you thought about this passage? You know, she has mentioned it. I'm like, you know, I would never have thought about this passage, but it is a pretty well-known passage of scripture. In fact, it's one of the most famous stories coming from the reign of King Solomon, a king who was known for his wisdom in spite of his penchant for women. You look it up, he had what, like 2,000 wives and 9,000 concubines or something crazy like that. It was a high number, just know that. Too many wives and concubines for any one man to keep up with. But he was still known as the wisest man who ever lived. And this is one of his more famous stories. It's the story of two women who come to him and they're both claiming that this one baby belongs to them. And in a lot of ways, when we think about this story, we think about it as a time that King Solomon demonstrated his wisdom. You know, he essentially tested the women to figure out which one of them was the mother of the child and then the woman that passed the test you know, who didn't want to see the child die, that was the woman that he figured out was the child's mother. And so when we think about this passage, we think more about Solomon's actions. Indeed, you know that I like the New American Standard Bible because that's the Bible that my father in the ministry taught us to use. But even if you look in that Bible, the heading of this particular section of scripture is Solomon wisely judges. So it's all about Solomon. And what a good judge he was, but it doesn't really talk much about the women who make up the bulk of the story. So today we are going to focus on the women that make up the bulk of the story and talk about three things we can learn about grief, grief, motherhood, and support from this passage. But before we jump on to that, we want to talk about a bit of context because that's what I like to do here and that's what I feel God calls me to do. So this passage starts off in the first verse of it, which is verse 16, by letting us know that these women were harlots. And what is a harlot, you might ask? A harlot is a prostitute. It's the biblical term for prostitute. And I know I've said this in some form before, but we have to understand that in those days, a woman did not have many options to support herself if she was outside the home of, say, her father or her husband or another male relative that was willing to take care of her. So a lot of women had the option of, you know, living in poverty, being prostitutes or being prostitutes living in poverty. There weren't really a lot of options out there. So yes, we know there may have been some exceptions to the rule. Like when we get to the new Testament, we think about Mary and Martha and we know how Martha owned the house that Jesus was coming to. But I will say that there are some who also believe that Mary of Bethany, who that's where they lived, that Mary was a prostitute as well. But the point is, prostitution was very common, and a lot of women who ended up being prostitutes didn't really have another option. So, but this passage, in addition to letting us know that these women were prostitutes, it also lets us know that they lived in the same house. They were essentially roommates and quite possibly, you know, co-workers as well in a sense that that may have been the house they operated their prostitution out of but we can assume that the women knew each other pretty well but another thing that tends not to get as much attention when we talk about this passage is this fact that I hadn't even thought about until I read this passage more closely for today and that is that both of these women were mothers not just one both were they both had recently given birth and in fact They only gave birth approximately three days apart, according to this passage. The one woman gave birth three um, three days after the other one. And unfortunately, the one that gave birth later, her child ended up dying within the same day that she gave birth. So this already changes a lot of what we know about this passage by the way that it's generally told. You know, for starters, the fact that the women were prostitutes explains why they were left alone with the newborns. I mean, yes... Fathers didn't have the most active of roles, but, you know, it does explain a bit more about why these women were in such close proximity that one could steal the other one's child. You know, because generally women gave birth in their homes and these women, you know, they lived together. Um, 
And we also can think of it as, yes, fathers didn't have a major role in child rearing at that time, but it's not like a prostitute could easily identify, you know, the father of her children. You know, we live in an era where DNA testing is a thing. But back then, best case scenario, you could rely on the fact that a child may look a lot like their father. But, you know, that's not always the best way to distinguish. So just saying that these women had no real support because they were prostitutes. So this helps us to understand that this is not just a, purely a story of a deranged woman who stole another random woman's child and tried to pass it off as her own, but it's the story of a grieving mother who tried to switch her dead baby with her friend and roommate's living one. And before I move on, I'm gonna add in that we know the mother whose child had been switched would recognize her child right away. Because mothers can always recognize their children, even after just a few days. In fact, this speaks to how egregious this incident really was. Because, for one, mothers generally don't let their babies out of their sight this early in their life. I mean, I can think back to last year when First Lady and I, you know, first brought baby boy home from the hospital. Like, we were always watching him. There wasn't a time where one of us wasn't with him. And the only people who were allowed to be close to him were, you know, people who we loved and people who we trusted, right? So, you know, not just anybody off the streets will be able to walk in our house and be near our baby. And that lets us know that this woman trusted her roommate to be around her baby, perhaps because, you know, as scripture says, there was no one else in the house with them. They were all they had to get themselves through this difficult time because, you know, childbirth child, uh, and especially those first few days with newborn, those are pretty difficult times. And we can also add in that because these women were prostitutes, they probably also really needed each other to get through this time because their income was likely pro compromised, especially, you know, during the latter stages of their pregnancy. So now that we have gone over um, this context, I'm going to jump into my first point. We talk about mothers needing support is that we cannot underestimate the power of grief. Again, we cannot underestimate the power of grief. So as I said earlier, we tend to leave out the fact that both women in this passage who approached King Solomon were mothers. But the other thing we tend to leave out is how the child died. The one whose child died, died through a very common yet avoidable accident. She fell asleep on the child. Like she fell asleep and inadvertently rolled over on him. The pastor says she lay on him. And as the parent of a one-year-old, I remember how during doctor's visits, first lady and I were always asked where the baby boy slept, you know. Is he in a crib? Is he in a bassinet? And they wanted to make it clear that he needed to have his own place to sleep. Yes, we could hold him during naps, but he needed to have his own place to sleep because of accidents like the one that happened in this passage. And you do hear them happen pretty often. You know, as sweet and loving as like co-sleeping arrangements can be, they can also be pretty dangerous because let's face it, we as parents are much bigger than our children and you know, they wouldn't have the strength or the ability to tell us to move if we roll over on them, like what happened in this passage. But I'm bringing this up because some would interpret the detail of how this baby died as the mother being careless. But I really want us to be empathetic there's no evidence that this woman was careless and would have been a bad mother otherwise. Keep in mind, both women who approached King Solomon were prostitutes, not just the one. But that means that they both were single mothers who had little support. And this kind of thing usually happens because mothers or parents in general are tired and need extra support during the newborn phase. Because I can tell you, newborns don't sleep for more than maybe an hour at a time 
when they first are born. In fact, you can laugh at the whole concept of sleeping like a baby because whoever said sleeping like a baby must not have been around any babies because babies do not sleep. <laughs> like, especially in those very early days, that baby might sleep and still wake up like five, six times in the night hungry or needing a diaper change, you know. So just saying during those newborn stages, it's pretty easy for parents to, especially mothers, to be overwhelmed. And it's times like this when support, going back to the title of this message, but when support is all the more important. But that support wouldn't have been available for these women who, as prostitutes, wouldn't have had relationships with the children's fathers and likely didn't have families that they could go back to, which is a part of how they ended up becoming prostitutes in the first place. And the passage makes it clear that these women were alone in the house together, supporting each other after giving birth. So now, getting back to the one whose child died, to have her child die so soon after it was born would have led to a type of pain that for most of us would be unimaginable. And I personally never want to have to experience that kind of pain. I'm not bringing that up to excuse her actions, right? She did steal her friend's child. And as sad as it is, this sort of thing happens even to this day. I mean, there have been many high-profile stories of women who experience loss of a baby, whether through miscarriage or through stillbirth or things like that, who will kidnap someone else's child shortly after losing theirs at the same time. And some of these women actually get away with raising these children as their own for several years. You know, you can look it up. There are a lot of stories of this where a child turns 18 and realizes that the woman they thought was their mother had actually kidnapped them from their biological parents. But I'm bringing this up to point out that the kind of grief that a mother can experience upon the death of her child is like nothing else in the world. And that that grief, when you don't have support, may lead that mother to do things she would not do under normal circumstances. So even if this woman in this passage is a bit of a caricature, we shouldn't forget that people like her really exist, that the power of grief is real, and that because the power of grief is real, we need to do our best to support mothers, even when they're vulnerable, like the women in this passage were. So the second point is this. So the first point was we should not underestimate the power of grief. The second point is we should understand that a mother's love causes her to sacrifice. We should understand that a mother's love causes her to sacrifice. So just imagine this. You figure out that your roommate, who's presumably your friend, has stolen your child after her own baby died. You figure out somehow to get this issue brought up before the king, which is amazing in and of itself, but lets you know how far a mother will go when she's trying to protect the life of her child. And then the king gets out a sword, and the solution is, let's cut that baby in half. That way you both can have a piece of him. What would you do? Well, when King Solomon proposed cutting the baby in half, the mother of the child reacted in a way that many of us relate to. She knew that cutting her child in half will result in his death, so she backed off and told King Solomon, you know what, don't kill him, let the other woman raise him. Why? Because she knew that was the only way her child would live. And it's a sad thing to think about when you find yourself in a situation where the only way your child can live is if they live without you. But this woman was so intent on making sure her child survived that she was willing to do just that. Now, for the record, we know that King Solomon's proposed solution, which really was a test, is not what any of us would have anticipated given the situation. The woman approached the king because she wanted her child back. But again, when given the choice between his death and his absence, she chose his absence. And that was what King Solomon knew she would do if she were indeed the real mother. Why? Because mothers, and good mothers at that, will always prioritize the needs of their children. So as I said in the last point, and honestly a few times by now, these women were both prostitutes, and I believe scripture points that out 
to let us know that the life they led didn't necessarily impact their ability to be good and caring mothers. As I've said, that was one of the few options available to women without a father to take care of them or a husband to take care of them or another male relative who was willing to. And I'm putting that out there again because a lot of us will look at this through our 21st century eyes, right? And we'll think of it as in the same way we think of people today. Like, well, no, you got a choice. You didn't have to do that. Well, a lot of women in those days did not have a choice. You know, there were not a lot of jobs that were available to women. Society was based around men. So women did what they needed to do to take care of themselves and their children. And unfortunately, ended up having children in the process because for prostitutes, children are an occupational hazard. But I want to point this out, this is quite different than even what we see today, where there are some people who willingly choose sex work, you know, because it can pay well in some contexts. And yes, I'm talking about, you know, exotic dancers, people who do OnlyFans, and of course, you know, the people who do porn, we know them. There are some people who choose that, not to mention there are some places like in Nevada where prostitution is legal. And I'm saying those sex workers of today are pretty different than the prostitutes of the biblical times who primarily did it just because that's the only thing they could do to take care of themselves. And I'm saying this to make it clear that some of us got caught up on, would get caught up on the fact that these women were prostitutes, but it's not mentioned in this passage to point out a character flaw. It's mentioned to point out the lack of support that they would have had in that particular system. So when given the choice, the child's mother prioritized his life over her own desire to raise him. And that's a painful place to be. We wouldn't wish that on anybody. But before I go into my next point, I do need to say one thing. Because I just talked about prioritizing her child's life over her own desire to raise him. So... The concept of prioritizing the child's life has nothing to do with abortion. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because it seems like the anti-abortion crowd has co-opted all all language that is related to life. Again, I say this because it seems like the anti-abortion crowd has co-opted all language related to life. So I don't want you to walk away from this message believing that I'm saying something that I am not saying, all right? This isn't the story about an unwanted pregnancy or one that may have needed to end for medical reasons. This is a passage about two women who desperately wanted their babies and one who stole the others after hers tragically died. I'm talking about prioritizing the life of a child that was stolen. So don't twist my words into something else. All right. And with that, we're going to move on to the third point. So the first point, again, was we should not underestimate the power of grief. The second point is we need to understand that a mother's love will cause her to sacrifice. And the third point is this. We need to understand that some people can't allow us to be happy when they aren't. So if there was any indication of a character, if there was any, let me start this again because for some reason I'm tongue-tied. If there is any indication of a character flaw among the woman who stole the other one's child, it is in her reaction to King Solomon's proposition. Because we said, the mother of the child should have been horrified at the prospect of cutting her child in half with a sword. And a regular empathetic person would also be horrified at the prospect of cutting a child that they loved in half with a sword. Again, and if you need some background on that, remember when we go back to the story of Abraham and Isaac, we find that when God had Abraham bring Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice him, Abraham hesitated. Abraham did not want to sacrifice his son. Abraham loved his son. And so when we saw that happen, Uh, Of course, Siri was eavesdropping just then. But I brought up what happened with Abraham because of the fact that we see that parents in general don't want to see any harm come the way of their child. But yet this woman was like, you know, her reaction was not what we would have wanted to see. Her reaction was like, 
he shall be neither mine nor yours. Like exact words taken from the passage. So we can see now what's really going on here. This woman was completely aware that her child had died and in her grief, she didn't want anyone else around her to experience the joy associated with motherhood, including her own roommate and potential friend who had given birth a few days earlier. Now that she knew she wasn't going to get away with stealing her housemate's baby, she was intent on keeping her friend from motherhood as well. So it is possible to argue that this was a response to her grief. I mean, like we said, she did just lose a baby in a very tragic way just a few hours after it was born. But it's nonetheless problematic. She was so grief stricken that she wanted others to experience that same grief even if she were the cause of it, which she would have been in this situation. She was willing to have that baby die just because she wouldn't admit, you know what, this is not my child. And it's sad, but we all know people who are just like that, just maybe not in the same context. For instance, maybe you know somebody who started wishing trouble on everyone's marriage after their marriage fell apart and ended in divorce. Maybe you know someone who started wishing a decline in everyone's health after they were diagnosed with a major illness and witnessed a decline in their own health. Maybe you know someone who started wishing everyone else trouble with their finances after they had to file bankruptcy. And maybe you don't just know someone like that because you're like that yourself. Maybe you're too busy comparing yourself to others to be happy for them when you're struggling. You get the idea. And there are some people who are incapable of being happy for anyone else when they are going through challenges. It's sad, but it's true, and it happens often. Well, what we find is that this woman, the woman who stole the other one's child, was that kind of person who was incapable of being happy for anyone else when she was going through And it's not because of her career as a prostitute, like some of us would have thought. And truth be told, it's not necessarily because of her grief. But if anything, what we can learn from this passage is that we do need to make sure we don't allow our grief or anything else in our lives to make us get to the point where we just can't be happy for anyone around us. We can't allow ourselves to become jealous of the blessings of others while we're in the midst of our own pain. Instead, we should strive to celebrate the blessings of others and use them as reminders that we serve a God who is capable of doing the same things for us. So as we come to a conclusion, I do want to point out this story did have a bit of a happy ending. The child was reunited with his mother after King Solomon correctly deduced that the real mother would not have wanted her child to be cut in half. But what I want to focus on is this. As sad as it is, there are a lot of people in this world, like the other mother in this story, who experience tragedies, even as many of us are being blessed. And those people aren't always deranged, like the mother who stole the baby in this passage, but they're still suffering silently. And that's why the concept of community is so important. The mother in this passage probably fell asleep on her child because she was tired and needed help and support. And as the parent of a one-year-old, I can tell you that the newborn days were among the most taxing days I have ever experienced in my life. And I'm not the mother. So as hard as it is for me, I can only imagine what my wife was going through. We did work together as a team, but we were incredibly grateful for our mothers, Deaconess Julia and... (laughs) Deaconess Rhonda, who were over all the time holding the baby, you know, supporting us, giving us advice when we needed it. And we're also thankful for the friends and family members who stopped by periodically, the ones who gave us food when we didn't have enough energy to cook for ourselves, the one who brought by supplies and gave us some ideas about things we would need as first-time parents that we wouldn't have known otherwise. You know, it really made it possible for us to survive. And don't get me wrong, it still was overwhelming. But I am incredibly grateful to the village that God had provided for us in those early days of baby boy's life. 
because it really does take a village to raise a child. That's not just a saying. It's truth. But as this passage points out, both of these women had no one but each other because their job made them outcasts in their society. So as we come to a close, I don't want us to leave just thinking about how this woman stole her friend's child and King Solomon was able to reunite them. I want us to remember that mothers in general need support. Raising children is difficult. Tending to newborns is difficult. Taking care of yourself while taking care of a newborn is difficult. And we as a society need to do our part to support all mothers, no matter their job, no matter their income, no matter their relationship status, no matter the size of their family or the size of their support system, so that they have the chance to provide the kind of structured and supportive environment that their children deserve. And God bless you all. That brings us to the end of today's message. I did not have enough time to have my usual cup of tea, so we're just going to jump right into... Um, we're going to jump right into opening the doors of the church, all right? And I'm going to put this back up so that we can fill out, so you know how to fill out a contact card. But some of you may be wondering, you know, this message was really all about King Solomon and how God used King Solomon to determine who the rightful mother was in this passage. But also, we can't forget that mothers need support. And I ended this message by talking about the importance of community, which is really what churches are. A church is a community. We work together. We support each other. We help each other. And the thing that unifies us as a church is our belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins. So if you would like to become a part of either this church or just the general body of believers, of those of us who believe in Jesus Christ. If you would like to be a part of that support system for someone else or you need that support, well, I encourage you to first build a relationship with Jesus Christ himself. And how do you do that? You can pray this prayer after me right now. You can say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. If you prayed that prayer with me today, congratulations, you are now saved. We would love to hear from you. So you can fill out the contact card. You know, the link is above. You can also write us a comment in today's um, service and you'll hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon and we'll pray with you and help you figure out the next steps in your journey as a believer, whether that's uniting with us as a ministry or even finding another ministry that might be closer to you. Because as I said earlier, we do plan on opening a building someday. But we also know there are some people who might be okay with, you know, being virtual members of a church that's not in their area. But we just want to hear from you and figure out how we can support you. Or maybe you're somebody who already identifies as a believer, but you're looking for a community to be a part of, a community like ours that is comfortable having difficult conversations about the oppression that exists in our society, a, com a community that believes that social justice is not in addition to the gospel, but a part of it, a person who believes that Jesus came back to liberate us all from the oppression in our societies, you know, and not just to focus on the afterlife. You know, yes, the afterlife is a good thing, but we also have jobs to do while we are here. Um, you know, maybe you're looking for a church that is passionate about um, the issues that exist in our society, the issues in our political system, the division that exists, um, the problems that exist in our communities, and maybe you would like to be a part of the solution, just like we would like to be a part of the solution. We do have a big vision, and we need people to be a part of it. So if you feel God tugging on your heart, I also encourage you to unite with us, this ministry as Pivot Point Gathering. You know, and we would love to hear from you. So you can let us know in the contact cards. You can let us know in the comments. Um, you'll hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. Or maybe you're somebody who's just in need of prayer. We do believe in the power of prayer. You can send us a prayer request through your contact card. You can send us a prayer request 
through our Instagram and Facebook stories. You can direct message us. And you can also write your prayer request in the comments of today's service if you're live with us on Facebook right now. If you write your comments down, we will um, pray for them before service is over. And I already see some that have come through. So thank you all. And lastly, we encourage you to fill out a contact card if you'd like to be added to our mailing list. That way you will know what events are coming up in our ministry. Um, and we do have some more events coming up. We've talked about the um, 1619 Project um, event. And we're also going to have another barbecue this year at some point. You know, So look out for that. Not to mention the women's ministry will be back. And we're also um, working behind the scenes on creating something for men to get together to do. All right? So if you'd like to know about those events before they become public or on our social media, um, fill out a contact card and we'll add you to our list. All right? So now I see some prayer requests that have come through today. I am going to review those prayer requests. Um, but just thank you for... Um, just thank you all for your support of this ministry. You know, we love you all. Um, and to all of the mothers in our congregation, happy Mother's Day once again. Um, you know, I hope your families have time to celebrate with you. That's what we're doing right after service. So, and I'm going to put the prayer requests back up on the screen so that we all can see them. These are the general prayer requests for the ministry. But I know that um, yeah, those are the general prayer requests for the ministry, but I know there are some prayer requests that have been submitted, so I will be praying for those as well. And some of you will see me, you know, opening my eyes during the prayer so I can make sure that I review them correctly. All right. But thank you all again for spending this time with us on your Mother's Day. We love you all. We really do love the mothers in our ministry. Happy Mother's Day again from Pivot Point Gathering. We love you all. So with that, we are going to close out, all right? And like I said, you may see me open my eyes because I got to look to make sure I don't miss any prayer requests, but I love you all. And as my father in the ministry was so fond of saying, God loves you and so do we, all right? With that, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We pray that you will just help us to remember that we need to do our part to support the mothers in our environment. And that is why, as we were talking earlier, um, those other roles are so important in our communities as well. The aunties, the godmothers, the big cousins, like because it really does take a village to raise a child. So help us to seek out the mothers in our lives and be able to support them, you know, Help us to know that even if they have husbands around, even if they have boyfriends around, raising children takes a community and not just one or two people. So don't be afraid to reach out to a mother and be a source of support because I guarantee you she needs it. Help us to know that we need to reach out to mothers. Help us to know that we can support them. Help us to not be afraid to reach out, not assume that they have everything together because they probably need that moment to breathe, to rest, to relax, to remember who they were before. Or just to have a moment to clear their own heads. So help us to know that we can support mothers. We also pray for all the prayer requests that we share each week as a ministry for our location for our capacity, about the violence in the streets, about the mass shootings happening around our country, about the disparities that exist in health in our communities, about our families that are bereaved, and about the nonsense that's in our political system. We know that you can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, so we just pray that you would bring about the solutions that we need in all these instances. And we pray about all those prayer requests that have been shared. We pray for Uncle William and for Deaconess Julia, for Reverend George and for Evangelist Tyra, for Reverend Simone and for Sister Jerry Simpson. You know the needs in those situations. And we thank you for Sister Victoria who knew to bring those names to the altar. 
we just pray you would work on the behalf of all of them in these situations and just let them know that they can trust and depend on you because you will work out what they need. We know some of them are dealing with illnesses. You know, some of them are just dealing with stress. But whatever it is they're dealing with, we pray you will show yourself, not just for their benefit, but so that they can tell other people of your goodness and share, you know, all the things that you have done for them. We also pray for Sister Victoria, who is in need of guidance for her job, in need of guidance with her pursuit of opportunities in theater, and just in need of a touch from you with her health. We also pray for um, Jordan. You know the need in that situation. We thank you that he is still doing well. We pray that you will be with the doctors as they figure out what is going on with him and just help him as he needs direction for his life. We thank you that things have been going better with he and his mother, Sylvia, and we just pray that you would have your way and continue to draw them closer to you and show yourself in their lives and in their relationship. But we pray for Jordan as he's still recovering from his kidney stones. And we pray that you would just have your way, um, show yourself in our lives, and even with those prayer requests, that those that may come in through our contact card, those that may be submitted later on through our Instagram and Facebook stories, we pray that you would have your way. And we ask a special blessing on all of those for whom this is a difficult season, those who've lost their mothers, those whose mothers are still here, but they just have difficult relationships with their, with their mothers, you know, those who are estranged, those who never had a relationship with their mothers, those whose mothers died when they were young. We know there are plenty of people in our society for whom Mother's Day is complicated, and we pray that you will just help them to know that you love them and you care from them, for them, and you feel their pain and they are not alone, and that they can trust and depend on you. And we pray that you will raise up a community for those people, an understanding community for them who will just understand that this is a difficult time, and we ask a special blessing on those for whom this is their first Mother's Day without their mother, first Mother's Day without their grandmother, first Mother's Day without that loved one. Just hold them close to you and let them know that they are not alone. And now we pray for all those who had prayer requests that remained unspoken and stayed on their hearts. Just take care of any concerns we may have. We pray that you will move in our lives Show yourself in our lives that people will come to know more about you as they interact with us. And as we leave this place and go back to our respective destinations, we pray that your angels would encamp around about us to keep us in all of our ways. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth and forevermore. And we ask a special prayer for Reverend Michael Locke. But we just pray that you would be with us as we leave this place and bless us and keep us and let your face shine upon us. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. And God willing, we will see you next week. But happy Mother's Day. We love you all. And yes, and yes, Sylvia, I was thinking about Talita, Khan, and Shimi. You know, when we're thinking about the bereaved families, this is their first Mother's Day without Sharon. And, you know, they were all very close to their mother. So we want to continue to keep those families in our hearts and let them know that they're not alone. This may be a hard time for them, but, you know, they have support and we want to let them know they have support. So with that, God bless you all. God willing, we will see you next week.